right. Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary <clears throat> on Thursday, January, uh, February 17th, 2021, uh, 2022. And uh, moving right along, first today uh, is S163, which is an act relating to state court jurisdiction for special immigrant juvenile status. Our first witness is Rebecca Wasserman uh, from Legislative Council. And I'm having one of those days where I feel like we did this before. Um, so maybe you can help us understand what we did before and what we're doing now, or did the bill not pass the House, or what happened to it? Um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. So you are correct. You did work on this um, two years ago. Um, so just for some context, um, the special immigrant immigration, um, sorry, immigrant juvenile status is a status that is under federal law that allows immigrant, immigrant children who are subject to the jurisdiction of a state juvenile court. So in Vermont, that would be the probate court or the family division, um, who can't reunify with their parents due to um, abuse, abandonment, or neglect um, to get a, an, a, a special order under a state court that allows them to file for a petition with the US uh, CIS um, for this status to, to essentially stay in the country. Um, so this, this status is unique under federal law because it requires a state court order in order um, first in order to file this petition. So um, the legislature did pass this law two years ago that allows for a, the family court and the probate court to, um, to issue these orders uh, upon a petition and make the findings that are necessary to allow an immigrant child to file these petitions. And this bill is um, making some changes to what was put in law a couple of years ago. Um, specifically, the, the primary change is that federal law says that um, children under 21 years old are eligible for this, but the way um, child is defined under uh, state law here in Vermont, um, it really, this currently only applies to um, uh, folks under 18 years old. So this is expanding the jurisdiction um, in just this particular instance um, for this type of petition to the sort of 18 to 21 that is left out um, of the of state law currently, but is eligible um, under the federal law. All right, very good. Help. So that pretty much is the walk through of the bill. Sorry, I, I had a hard time hearing that. I'm sorry. Is that does that that's, complete yeah, the walk through? Okay. okay. I can I can start the walkthrough. Um so the uh the language that was put in a couple years ago was adding a new um subchapter in Title 14 under the guardianship uh, chapter for, uh, for uh, pro, uh, probate court. Um, and it, uh, this is changing um, the title of that chapter um, to refer to at-risk non-citizen children. And those there's a definitions now that are um, included in this bill that sort of clarifies um, exactly who this applies to and expands that jurisdiction to the, um, the under 21 year, years old rather than just the 18 and under. And um, so on the bottom of page one, um, then going out to page two was this new subsection A on with definitions for um, use in the subchapter. So this, there's a new definition um, for at risk, uh, which means that there's um, reason to suspect that the child's health, safety, or welfare is in jeopardy due to abuse, neglect, or abandonment, 
or sim similar circ circumstances and that child can't be returned um, to, to their country of origin or their parents' country of origin because it would not be in the best interest of the child. And this is really tracking um, the requirements under federal law mm -hmm. um, that the findings that have to be made in order for them to receive this status. Um, Becky, there's, yeah. If, if I might, um, just when you were describing what the bill did, it seemed uh, extremely limited, just moving from 18 to under 21. Um, but but there's a lot of underlined language here, and I'm just wondering if you can characterize overall, if if what we're doing is just changing the age, why is there so much additional material? Yes. So the the primary thing it was doing is expanding that that jurisdiction, but it is making, I think it's clarifying to uh, better track the federal. Um, requirements, the language in federal law. So it's making some clarifications um, by adding in these definitions. Um, and it, it, it is also adding in um, some additional uh, language with respect to um, a, a, ch a child who meets the status ability to get um, sort of other protective services, it does speak to um, sort of the guardianship uh, limitations around the child. So um, I guess I would characterize that more, more than just clarifications, um, but I think uh, other folks can speak to why that is necessary yeah. in, in practice to make these changes. Okay, so it sounds like we're, we're building on or expanding what we did last time. Right. Okay. Um, so I can move back to the definitions on page two. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, there's an, a definition added for child, which, which has been changed to an unmarried individual or individuals who have not yet attained 21 years of age. Um, Subdivision three is a definition of court, um, which refers to probate or family division, because mm -hmm. these are the courts that under the federal law would meet the um, requirements to, to issue these uh, orders. And this was in the language originally, it was just um, moved from the, the end of this section to this new definition section. Um, dependent on the court means that uh, this individual is subject to the jurisdiction of either of these courts Non-citizen, it refers to a person who is not a US citizen. And um, there's also a definition of similar circumstances, um, which is a condition that is comparable to abuse, neglect, or abandonment, including the death of a child, uh, sorry, of a parent, which would make a child eligible um, for these findings. So subsection B um, is the, the jurisdiction of the probate and family court to issue these uh, orders and make these findings. And if you move um, to page three, um, so this is some new language that was added um, that says that an at-risk non-citizen child whom charges have been filed in the criminal division may file a petition for this status in um, probate or family court. Um, so I think this is an example of perhaps something that has happened uh, in practice that others can speak to as to why um, this is being added here about um, if a child has had criminal charges filed against them. That seems strange. Oh. So if the child has criminal charges against them, Say they're a, a 17 year old. They could file a petition to have the, on their own volition, to have the charges dropped to a, a probate or? No, I think this is saying if a child who meets this definition of an at risk non citizen child has criminal charges filed against them. Um, they can file for this special juvenile status in probate or um, family court. And I think this uh, has to do with their immigration status. Okay, so, 
I, I think this is essentially saying if these criminal charges would be impacting their immigration status, they would they would be able to file for this special status to, to stay here um, in one of those in family or probate court. Okay. So subsection C is the procedure for a petition. Um, I would characterize the changes here as just um, maybe more mirroring what is in the, the federal law. Um, so it says that if an at-risk uh, non-citizen child petitions the court for special findings for this uh, special immigrant juvenile status, the court would uh, review that and any supporting evidence and issue of findings of fact that determine the child um, is one dependent mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. court um, or legally committed to or placed under the custody of a state agency or department um, that is appointed by the court. Uh, two, that the child has suffered from abuse, neglect, abandonment, or similar circumstances. Uh, three, that the child may not be viably re reunified with one or both parents due to that abuse, neglect, abandonment, or similar cir circumstance pursuant to Vermont law. And that finally, it's not in the child's best interest to be returned to their country or their parents' previous country of uh, nationality. I'm having a hard time understanding this in light of going to age 20. Um, because generally, um, well, maybe I better hear from the witnesses, but I'm having a hard time understanding how the child gets into DCF custody, for example, as a 19 year old. <clears throat> so there. Uh, there is language um, I'll get to a little further down that says that um, for these purposes, uh, a, a person could um, either have their guardianship extended to, to allow for this um, particular status, or they could request to be under guardianship just for this particular status. Um, so subdivision three, um, so this is new language here um, that says, uh, so on page four, line 16, that um, the court when making these determinations will also consider the child's health, safety, or welfare. Um, and that looks at whether their present or past living conditions will adversely affect the child's physical, mental, or emotional health. Um, subdivision four on line 20, sorry, was there a question? Oh, okay. um, subdivision four on line 20 is this um, extension of guardianship. So at the request or consent of that child who is presently under a guardianship, the court can extend that existing guardianship of the person for a ward past 18 years of age uh, for purposes of allowing them to complete this application. So that's one example if they were already under guardianship, they could request to have that extended. And then subdivision five allows for requesting an initial guardianship. So with the consent of that child, the, the court may appoint a guardian for someone who is unmarried um, and who is 18 years old, but not yet 21 years old in connection with making this type of petition. Subsection D is a notice requirement. Um, so if the identity or location of the child's parents are unknown or if that child's parents live outside of the United States, um, the court may serve notice using an alternative method of service that it deems appropriate or they may waive that service. Um, subsection E speaks to, um, in order to serve the best interests of the child, um, a court shall adjudicate and make these, issue these findings um, as, it, as soon as it is administratively feasible um, and prior to that child attaining 21 years of age. 
top of page six. Um, so this is another example of some, some new language that I think um, other witnesses may speak to the need for, but the subsection F is uh, referral for services or protection. Um, so the court um, can refer one, uh, a child that is the subject of a petition for um, other services, including psychiatric, psychological, educational, occupational, medical, dental, or social services. Um, however, that child's participation is voluntary in those services. Subsection G um, says that um, this section of law doesn't limit the child's um, ability to petition for special findings under any other provision of law or from any other rights and remedies available, available to that child under the law. And it doesn't issue, uh, limit the court from issuing similar findings in any other proceeding concerning the child. Subsection H clarifies that um, for, for the child who is um, 18 years or older, um, this extension of guardianship to them doesn't um, abrogate any of the rights that that child may have as an adult under state law. And uh, subsection I um, is, says that this section shall be liberally construed to promote the best interests of the child. On page seven, um, as I mentioned, there, there is currently in law on, uh, you'll see in lines 10 and 11, a definition of court that included family and probate court. And because a new uh, definition section was added in subsection A, that was just moved to that, uh, that new subsection. And section two of the bill is an effective date. So the act will take effect on July 1st of this year. Can I ask a question on line 19 of page eight, uh, page six? What does liberally mean in, in terms of, I know what liberal means, but I, I don't usually see this in terms of. Um, um, I think that it's. Statute. I think the, um, the intent here is that it will be uh, construed in sort of the best interest in the, of, the, of the child in the sort of the most flexible way to, um, to allow for these petitions to be successful or these, these court orders and these findings to be made. Thank you. We should probably hear from Judge Zone at the next hearing on this. I, I had a quick question about um, Becky uh, at the bottom of page five, when it says that any petition shall be completed as soon as it is administratively feasible <clears throat> and prior to the at-risk non-citizen child attaining 21 years of age. Just wondering how binding, it's a similar question to the chair's question about liberally, um, as soon as it is administratively feasible is obviously putting more pressure, but is there any, is there any binding way for the applicant to invoke that? Yeah, this doesn't include like a, it shall be heard in X number of days. I think um, it is encouraging the, the application to be, Yeah. The petition to be heard quickly, but um, what about the second part that it shall be done before they reach twenty-one years of age? Um, I think it and shall because I mean it is it is sort of it is mandatory there shall that it sh shall be heard before they are twenty-one um, I, because they wouldn't be eligible if they. Yep. I'm, I'm just wondering, does, does somebody have a right of action if, if they file their 20 and, you know, we've had a slowdown in the courts for obvious reasons. Um, does it, does it give them a right of action to sue the state if that's not done? 
Um, I actually don't know the answer to that, but I will um, I will do some research and get back to you on it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Becky? Becky, thank you very much. Um, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> and now our next witness is Rebecca Turner, who's the supervising attorney uh, with the Office of Appellate Division, Division Office of Defender General. Rebecca, welcome back. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. And it is good to be back. I don't think I've been before this committee this session. No. Um, for the record, Rebecca Turner, uh, appellate supervisor for the Office of the Defender General. Um, but as further background relevant for this bill, um, I'm also part of a team of attorneys in the ODG system that provides consults to criminal defense attorneys and to parents and children attorneys uh, in the chin stocket on immigration consequences that their clients face based on those criminal charges or having chins proceedings initiated against the family. Um, and, you've, and again, relevant to this discussion, before this, I was an immigration attorney, had my own immigration practice in Northern Virginia, DC area, where I represented um, adults and children in deportation proceedings, but also specifically worked on and represented children to help them petition for this particular status, special immigrant juvenile status. Um, so I bring all of that here today to sort of help you. Um, and I too had a groundhog moment preparing for this hearing uh, because I looked through my history of, of this issue and saw that it was February, March of 2020, right before the declaration, the emergency declaration from the governor that this, yep. Uh, we, 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 and I, I believe I testified, certainly reviewed and thought about it. Um, and, and it was a different bill, different language. And I actually didn't realize this had passed. So I see that in section 14 now. And I appreciate um, this bill actually coming back before this committee. And so uh, the, the full pullback lens uh, the Defender General's Office supports this, actually does see a reason for this committee and the legislature to revisit what was done in 2020 in that crazy period of time um, because there have, for, for, for a few reasons. And some of the questions through the walkthrough uh, sort of drew out those, those questions. Why are we back here? This seems very technical. Um, bigger than, than making clear jurisdiction. It includes not just the probate courts, but the family courts uh, and um, to maximize children who can benefit from this status. And so let me start, let me start there. Um, as you heard, the special immigrant juvenile status is uh, an immigration status under federal law. Congress passed this and I forget how long ago. What's unique, or I shouldn't say unique, but rare for different types of immigration statuses, asylum, right? Lawful permanent resident, green card, student visas, tourist visas. What's interesting and, and, and a little bit rare on this special immigrant juvenile status is Congress set it out to require sort of a two-part process, requiring state courts to make certain findings as to the child's um, best interests, the um, parental maltreatment, abuse and neglect, the viability or lack of viability of reunification with a parent. So Congress required that the state courts make key findings that is directly in their wheelhouse, generally speaking, not in federal immigration law, but in the wheelhouse of our state courts that review dependency proceedings, delinquency proceedings, uh, anything where they have jurisdiction over the juvenile. Uh, where they're reviewing the best interest of the child under state law. Congress required that the state courts make those findings. And once the state courts make those findings, they can then petition uh, the US Citizen and Immigration Service under the Department of Homeland Security for this special status. And what's wonderful about this status is that it's only for undocumented youth. And uh, there are very, very, very few ways generally for undocumented people to obtain lawful uh, status once they're here in this country. 
very, very few fully undocumented children. Congress recognized that uh, weighing all the policy reasons why that is the case, why there should be this special pathway to legal status for this particular <clears throat> most vulnerable um, population of at-risk undocumented youth who are often brought here without, you know, beyond their control, beyond their ability to do, and now they're in an extraordinarily vulnerable situation. In our situation in the ODG system, the way that these children fall on our laps is because something has happened to bring um, their welfare and their safety to the attention of the state, right? So the CHINS proceedings have been initiated. And while the state actors in the CHINS welfare system or the delinquency system or youthful offender criminal as it interacts with, with, with the family unit, as they're navigating the state law components of this, and, and again, focusing on the child's welfare, achieving that stability, that best interest of permanency for the child, right? They can work that hard, that long. All the parties may be in agreement. The court may be in agreement on as, as to what happens. Ultimately, though, the child remains undocumented, therefore vulnerable at any moment to being um, taken by ICE agents, put in removal proceedings, and deported. Right now, Congress didn't intend for this particular group for that to happen, carving out the special SIJ uh, S status. Again, back to why we're here, uh, jurisdictions around the country, state legislatures around the country have been uh, passing, revisiting, amending, passing again, their equivalent to uh, S-163 to sort of navigate the court findings that are required in their juvenile courts that will then be both well within their wheelhouse in terms of reviewing child welfare matters, but also qualify the child for the con congressional, uh, the, the federal status on SIG. Why we're back here is that, um, you know, navigating those requirements, those federal special immigrant juvenile status requirements <laughs> established by statutes as interpreted by, by federal regulations, USCIS it makes these decisions and where where a, a petition is rejected, they, a person can, a child can appeal it. And in 2019, October, mid-October 2019, so just a few months before this committee heard the last version of this that ultimately amounted to this statute being passed. Um, the three decisions relating to the special immigrant juvenile petition was reviewed and decided by the administrative appeal unit within the Department of Homeland Security. So they're appellate administrative court controlling for purposes of how USCIS interprets these federal guidelines. And this reviewing agency is called the AAO. Three decisions, two out of Massachusetts, reviewing Massachusetts family court decisions, making these special findings under their dependency statutes and child welfare statutes, one reviewing the Texas court's finding. And the long and short of these three decisions being issued the same day uh, made it clear that we had to, state legislatures, if they wanted to, to provide this um, pathway for certain children, uh, had to make it clear that this wasn't being done for the purpose of applying for a special immigrant juvenile status, that this wasn't just being done, these findings, just for the purposes of satisfying the federal statute, right? Instead, it has to be the um, purpose, underlying purpose is to address the child's best interests, the maltreatment underlying, right? Citing relevant state law, citing the factual basis that the parties bring forward as to why this has to happen. So I see the proposed changes in S-163 as trying to get to those issues. Um, that said, this, this overview view was supposed to stay general, but I think you're getting a flavor of how highly technical and complicated this status is as an immigration attorney and was a headache. Um, and, and I have a pile of, of alerts and decisions and other state legislation on this that I'm, I'm weeding through 
and have suggestions and ideas on how to make this pro current proposal better um, and, and ensure that I think the intent is to make clear that state courts can do this, that it is indeed inconsistent with their jurisdiction of, um, of overseeing the welfare of the child and best interests, then I think we should, uh, it, it, we should work on the current legislation and make it clear so that, so that the ultimate intent and motive, which is to assist these children in need, aren't actually thwarted, that, that the courts do this and then it ultimately isn't accepted at the federal level. I'll stop there, um, see if there are any yeah, questions. Uh, well, it might be helpful to me if I had an example of a child and how the current system works and how it would work with the passage of this bill with some changes that you may be recommending. And I urge you to work with Rebecca Wasserman on those changes. I'm happy, I'm happy to do it. You know, one of the, um, one case example that's helpful, and I forgot to mention this, the Vermont Supreme Court reviewed this very question, um, and it was not a case coming out of the ODG system, but we were consulted during the argument phase of it, and ultimately the question before the Vermont Supreme Court was this, the, the it was the family division in Addison unit was asked to make special findings uh, for an undocumented youth at risk of deportation, otherwise within the jurisdiction of this family unit in Addison County. Uh, and, and I'm just trying to see why it wasn't a chins, it was something else. And perhaps the VLS witness um, can talk about it because I understand they were representing this child, but the case name is Katoko v. Saloma. And the uh, for the record, I'll give this site, 2019 VT45. That came out in June 25, 2019. The question there was whether the, the lower court judge, the family court judge, uh, had the authority to make these findings. Um, again, it was revealed that, that the parties were trying to get this child ready, set up to apply for the special immigrant juvenile status before the child aged out. Again, aging out for purposes of qualifying for this federal status is 21, which is why you're seeing this, this strange extension language in this bill <clears throat> going beyond the normal Chins Court's jurisdiction of up to 18, right? Uh, and so the judge questioned whether he had the authority to so do. Uh, and so the Supreme Court issued this decision saying, yes, you do, because this is squarely within your authority as, um, as a judge considering the child welfare interest of the child to, to consider in terms of whether this makes sense. And so reversed it, send it back down for the judge to do. So there is that. I, I, um, I can give you more examples. The other, I think I can give you more anecdotally what we see come up in our system. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, all right. So 17 and a half year old in a Chin's case, uh, and there, the DCF files, uh, you know, the case is proceeding, reunification with the parents is deemed um, unlikely unreasonable based on the child's uh, need for permanency, right? And, and so all of the efforts have, have been made to try to get the parents on board for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Uh, one of the parents is a non-citizen, actually both parents are non-citizens, so is the child. No one has lawful status. In fact, one of the parents isn't even in the picture because in the middle of this process, ICE identified the person and arrested them and deported them. DCF was granted custody of the undocumented child and the child is placed in, in a foster uh, family. ODG attorney represents the child. So, and, 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 and the child supports termination parental rights. And the foster family has, uh, has an interest in continuing to take care of, of the child, but can't quite commit to adoption yet 
Uh, and, and again, we're having a 17 and a half year old who's undocumented is about to age out of the system without supports as well. Right now, everyone has an interest to, you know, best interest of this child. They know though, that the second that this child ages out, that, that the court's authority or jurisdiction, DCF's jurisdiction over this child will disappear and no adoption happens. And this child still has undocumented status. Right. And so you, no matter the best intentions of setting this child up for schooling, for whatever kind of resources are out there, uh, she will always remain vulnerable to being just deported. Now, in the meantime, this child has a, has siblings who may be U.S. citizens from from maybe there's there's a, there was a pathway for her younger siblings to have gotten U.S. citizenship, but not her because she was older. Um, her her siblings were born here, so they were automatic citizens. So these sort of situations arise where there are lots of reasons why we, why why DCF why 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 there's a there's a collective interest generally to have this child stay in Vermont, right? Family ties, uh, no other ties anywhere else, whether she's from Mexico or, um, you know, any other country, there's just no other ties. So then the question is, well, let's, she is otherwise eligible for the special immigrant juvenile status that gets her not only the status, but an eventual pathway to a green card, a lawful permanent resident, uh, card, which is a wonderful status to have as a non-citizen because it's permanent uh, and um, stable and also opens up doors for being eligible for certain uh, federal benefits. Um, and so again, a wonderful thing you want to set up for a child who is aging out of the DCF system. Uh, so everyone is on board and the state court doesn't quite know what to do, whether the state court family court has jurisdiction to make these findings. It's not quite, you know, it's, everyone understands this is federal immigration. So there are questions about that, right? Um, the Vermont Supreme Court has now made clear that, of course, these family courts can do this. This statute or this bill provides the courts with more specific guidance that will ensure that that the necessary dots are, and I, the, the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted correctly to match what's actually needed in the federal system. So that's why the state legislatures do this to sort of provide that assistance roadmap to the state courts, to the parties to help, um, to help protect these children, to ensure that actually the intent is, is there and get them going to get that petition uh, filed and hopefully approved. Great. Questions for Rebecca? Thank you so much, uh, Senator Benning. Rebecca, the looping in of probate court, you know what's going on there. I don't practice in this area. I'm just trying to get a handle on why they're being brought in. I, yes, I think, I think, and I also, I, I'm not in the probate courts, but I think that what it is is maximizing uh, the opportunities for children who so qualify to get these kinds of findings done before courts that have jurisdiction over juveniles, right? So the guardianships, uh, again, courts that would be making custody decisions um, and guardianship decisions. So that brings in the probate courts there. Um, and maybe someone from DCF can better spell out that. One of the concerns I have here, the, the earlier bill you know, and again, I don't know how much you want me to, to go through the specific concerns I have with I this. I think it'd bill. be helpful if, if you and Rebecca could come up with alternative language. We're on a yeah. tight road here. We've got two weeks to cross over. And so if you and Rebecca could come up with language that improves the bill, um, that would be helpful to present to the committee next week or the week after. I'll, I will do that and um, and that works. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to ask a question. Joe, Joe, are you, did you get the answer? Okay. Yes, go ahead, Senator Nick. I'm just wondering, initially when I looked at this bill, I'm, I was thinking of um, young people, you know, in the mass of, mass of people coming across the, from Mexico, I was thinking of those children but in thinking about it a little more, I'm thinking about the migrant farm workers who came over on their own, under 21, got here and are 
are here working. And so this would, it sounds like this would be another route for them to get into the system to get citizenship. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Senator Nick, I think that is correct. That's fair. I think one of the things that, that should be stressed is this is not an easy status to obtain. Um, and there are lots of challenges uh, to getting it. This is just one one of the challenges, getting the right, the, the court to to make these findings, whether the findings are adequate. But there are lots of uh, reasons why um, it is difficult to get, but it certainly is available to uh, people that you identified and is incredibly useful for this certain group, again, of, of, of high, high at risk youth who have, who have lost one or both family members uh, through abandonment, neglect, right, abuse, um, to let them and have a chance of getting legal status and, and starting fresh. But this is where I get confused when we talk about abuse and abandonment. My understanding was the abandonment occurs because ICE takes the parent and deports them. Um, so it's really not abandonment. I mean, they didn't have much the parent didn't have much choice. When I think about abandonment, I think of the parent who just, you know, gives up and, and doesn't want to deal with the child anymore. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that's the proper term. They've been left on their own because of circumstances beyond their control. They were brought over here from, let's say, Honduras. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, they weren't adopted by a Vermont family, so they don't have, once the adoption occurs, then they have U.S. citizenship. Is that correct? Yes. If, if the, if this, if the, I can remember dealing with a kid from Honduras who had been adopted by a, a Vermont family who was then got into trouble and ended up in my program. But he, um, and he's doing quite well now, by the way. Um, but he, uh, he he came over from Honduras as an adoptee. So he wouldn't come under this because once he's adopted, he's a U.S. citizen. Am I correct? You, 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 are, you are correct that adoption uh, by a U.S. Uh, parents gives a path, a quick path okay. to citizenship, and that's wonderful. And your point on abandonment and, and, and being sort of ironic Right, uh, and what that means is 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 fair enough. And I'll only add this, and, and I'll let uh, you you hear from the other witnesses. These these terms like abandonment, I gave you one example, but that is a very narrow definition. It shouldn't be confused as as encapsulating the entirety or scope of these terms. It's it's it it, um, and I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to go through more of the specific. No, I I, I think I'm understanding what what we're dealing with here. All right. Other questions for Rebecca? Rebecca, thanks so much for being with us on this. You're extremely helpful. And we look forward to seeing you next week um, or the week or actually the week after town meeting when we try to finalize this bill before crossover. Um, mm -hmm. Our next witness is Jill Rudge, who's with the Vermont Law School. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I am Jill Rudge. I am an assistant professor and senior staff attorney at the Immigration Project of the South Royalton Legal Clinic at Vermont Law School. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, for, I'll, I'll try not to repeat some of the excellent information that Attorney Turner has already shared with you all and just seek to build on it and then to maybe offer some examples from my own caseload that speak to some of the questions that have come up in conversation. Um, so, you know, to contextualize the experience I bring, I was an immigration defense attorney in New York City. I had um, an SIJ practice where I was litigating um, these special findings motions in uh, state courts in the New York City boroughs. And then with those orders uh, was petitioning on behalf of non-citizen youth for special immigrant juvenile status uh, from the federal government. And since I have come to Vermont, 
Um, I, I was practicing generals, practiced at Vermont Legal Aid, and then joined the law school clinic, um, returning to immigration. So the timing is such that I was not with the clinic at the time that Kotoko was litigated and decided. So I can offer some, um, if there's more questions about that case that was before the Vermont Supreme Court, I can speak a little bit to the procedural history, but I won't be as well versed as my predecessor and colleague, Aaron Jacobson, who is now at the Community Justice Project of the Attorney General's office. Um, but I do have some active cases. I'd be happy to share some examples of what this looks like day to day. Um, because Vermont is such a small state, um, I'm going to take great pains to try and anonymize some of the details. Um, because this isn't, you know, since the 2020 bill passed and clarified Vermont courts jurisdiction to issue these findings, there hasn't been an avalanche of demand, even with the arrival of you know, many, many folks at the southern border, um, and Vermont being such a welcoming state, it's not we're not being overwhelmed with requests um, for representation on these matters, but we have cases and the cases that we've been able to offer rep on have been truly transformative for both the immigrant youth and for their families and caregivers who are supporting them to access these immigration benefits. So I think it might be helpful if I begin with an example of a family court case um, for a young person who um, has experienced abuse, abandonment, and neglect by one of their parents. Um, this person was, um, their parent had fled domestic violence in their country of origin by the other parent um, and left my client in the care of grandparents. Um, that young person, as soon as they were able to come and follow to join, they did. Um, and they're now in Vermont reunited with their parent and they're both in, in a safe posture, but they're both undocumented. And because my client was um, had contact with immigration authorities at the, at the border crossing, um, my client is now in removal proceedings. So she's at imminent risk of deportation back to her country of origin where her grandparents are now too old to care for her and to protect her from the abusive parent, the other parent. Um, so in order to, so there's two things going on, right? My client has um, immediate needs, her health needs, her schooling needs, her safety needs. Um, she needs to invoke a defense against her removal to be able to stay in a, here in Vermont where she has a caregiver and has access to all of her basic needs for her well-being and safety. Um, and her parent with whom she is living is an undocumented person who has um, a real fear of facing adverse legal or immigration consequences for helping her child kind of navigate uh, the legal system and the school system and the hospital system. And so that my client's parent has petitioned for um, an order regarding her parental rights and responsibilities before the family division. And the purpose is to um, give my client's mother a document that really clarifies um, that she is the person who can safely and confidently support my client to access all of the systems that are designed to promote my client's health and well-being and, and safety and healing from what she experienced. Um, and my client also, while that matter is being litigated, the parental rights and responsibilities, is now in the position to submit a motion for special findings. Um, and while that proceeding is happening, now the family court judge has clear jurisdiction to make such findings according to the, the language of this bill. Um, so that my client can apply for special immigrant juvenile status and invoke that as a defense against her removal in immigration court. To offer an example from a probate division case, um, so I am representing a teenager who, um, a teenager who for reasons related to abuse, abandonment, neglect is not able to reunite with either parent. Um, that person um, came to Vermont, fled to safety in Vermont, um, where they have relatives, distant relatives. Um, that person is also a teenager, so um, they're getting close to the 18 mark. And they are also in removal proceedings because they were detected as they were crossing the border for safety from Latin America. That person 
um, similarly needs support with engaging in school and healthcare and all of the systems that Vermont has set up to help ensure that our youth um, are healthy and are supported in achieving their well being. But because my client does not have a parent in Vermont to initiate a parentage action, um, requesting an, an order regarding rights and responsibilities, instead, that person has a, my client has identified an adult. Um, who is able and willing to be a guardian and a support for my client and helping support her adjustment into her new life in Vermont. So that person has petitioned for guardianship over my client. And while that matter is being litigated regarding, you know, what the scope of the guardianship should be to promote the health and well-being and safety of my client, my client can make a motion for special findings. And even if given, you know, the, the slowdowns in the courts that the committee is referenced caused by COVID, even if my client is to turn 18 while the courts are backed up, she won't be precluded from having equal and equitable access to enjoying her full immigration rates afforded by the federal uh, statute, by INA 101A27J. And so you know, there are two examples. There are many others. Um, but I, I'll pause there in case there are any questions about those examples. No, this has been very helpful to me. Are there questions about those examples? So as these kids approached 18, they would then, under Vermont law, current law, not be eligible. Exactly. That's basically the problem. So this bill would make them eligible for continued guardianship. But they'd still, if they became U.S. citizens, they'd still have all the rights of an 18-year-old to vote. To Absolutely. Whatever, and whatever rights 18 year have. That's right, Chair. And, you know, and other rights that are really important to youth who are restabilizing and resettling their lives, right? So a person who has limited English proficiency, who has experienced trauma in their background and maybe hasn't had as much adult support in their life, they're here. And even if they're over 18, they might still be in a position where they're attending high school and they need assistance with getting a driver's license and having employment authorization so they can work to support themselves. If they ever wanted to pursue higher education, then they need a social security security number in order to request student loans. And even after they achieve that higher education, a person might need a social security number and status to obtain the necessary licensure to practice their trade. So it, it, you know, these pathways, I always like to say that these immigration statuses are really just keys that unlock the doors to everything else that a person needs, including access to the social safety net. A person is not eligible for most state or federal benefits without that pathway to permanency. And exactly as you said, Chair, this the bill as proposed, the main thrust of it, as I understand it, which is why my clinic fully supports the bill, is to... Uh, just close the justice gap for the small group of people 18 to 21 who otherwise under the federal statute would have access to permanency. Um, and this would be in keeping with um, similar legislation that has been passed by nearby neighboring states, Maine, Massachusetts, and New York. Thank you. Other questions for Jill? Any further comments, Jill? Um, no, I just thank you all for the opportunity. And well, um, Attorney Turner, I would I would love to connect with you offline um, about some of the uh, your concerns. I'd love to hear about them. Great. Um, our next witness, and I Will Lambic is here, and I want to make sure I I have listed um, Martina Canendo. And I probably messed that up <laughs> um but is she here or are you representing her or are you yeah thank you senator Sears. Un unfortunately uh, marita had to log off she had a oh i'm sorry commitment uh, not, not a problem so i i'll just fill in for her and i'll, I'll be very brief um uh marita had had more remarks prepared but um uh, migrant justice supports this bill um we we second everything that you heard from from jill just now and have collaborated on a number of cases and um, yeah, the, the types of experiences that you heard Jill speak about with her clients is, is something that is uh, unfortunately uh, common um, uh, for, for, for many immigrants in the state, particularly uh, uh, young immigrants um, uh, working in or uh, part of the, the dairy farm working community. 
um, which have uh, connections with migrant justice. So this is a bill that uh, is sort of a, uh, in some ways, a, a, a technical fix. It can feel kind of in the weeds, but uh, as you've heard, um, would have a, a really tremendous and, and positive impact for for a number of your constituents. And, and we hope that this is something that the, the legislature can act on. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and um, are there any questions for Will? Do you have any idea how many kids there might be in this situation um, in Vermont? Yeah, I don't know. I, I would hesitate to, to give a number because it, it would be very broad. Uh, um, but uh, Jill, do you, do you have any sense on um, uh, have, has your office tried to do an estimate? I'm in the same boat as you will. I think that, um, you know, I could speak to my own caseload and say that it is a growing part of our caseload, but not the main, you know, the majority of the highest proportion of cases that we do are asylum cases. Um, so, um, yeah, but I will say again, you know, and it's hard because as an Im immigration practitioner, I can only do so many cases. Um, so I have yeah. to kind of let go a little bit of the numbers because it's a lot of work, each individual case. But what I will say is I have observed how completely transformative um, even having one household member have access, a pathway to permanency, how it can transform and stabilize and, and increase safety for all of the household members. Thank you. Committee, any um Thank you all very much, all three of you. Um, if Rebecca Wasserman could come back on, I'm, she's here. Oh, Becky, thank you. Um, I, I hopefully you and um, Rebecca Turner can work uh, on some new language or updating the bill. Um, I'm curious. Um, but try, besides Judge Zone, who else should we hear from? Do you have any thoughts? Um, I think that the folks that I would have suggested were here today. Um, so I don't, I don't have any other um, thoughts on who else. Um, right. But I can maybe talk to a few people and see if I can get some okay. suggestions. And let let Peggy know, and we'll try to reschedule this next week. Um, it's on the agenda for Wednesday at 10.30. Okay, cool. Yes, Senator Nick. It's not totally clear to me. I mean, guardianship is one thing that's different. I mean, care and custody of the state of Vermont is different than just straight guardianship. But I'm wondering, um, I certainly would want to hear from the commissioner of DCF because are some of good these- point, Good point, good yeah. point. Are some of these 18 to 21 year olds it sounds like they might be moving into the custody of DCF and could go to a foster home or, you know, get all the services that they have. And I'm not clear how that all would work. Yeah. Yeah, because generally we make kids, um, unless it's a delinquency case under the raise the age, anybody that's 18 is mainly voluntary staying in the system. And I I think they can stay up till age 21 if they're involved in school or right. something of that nature. But it's a voluntary thing. That, yes, Paul, do you have? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. So I think, um, you know, the two examples, I, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the two examples that I gave for my caseload are, you know, an example of a straightforward someone finds themselves, a child under 21 finds themselves subject of proceedings in family court. And while they're there, there is clear jurisdiction for them to make a motion for special findings, similar to a young person who finds themselves subject of a proceeding in probate court. And now has the, there's clear jurisdiction for the court to hear a motion on special findings there. So I think with respect, and I, I, I would it would be great to hear from the commissioner of DCF on this as well. Um, with respect to the other reasons that a person, a young person might find themselves subject to a proceeding in juvenile court might include a chins proceeding or might include even a criminal proceeding. And the, the, the purpose or the effect of one making a motion for special findings as, you know, in the course of that proceeding doesn't have a, an effect 
on the overall resolution of that proceeding. Um, that is kind of a separate question. There's this narrow sub question of whether, given the fact that this youth is a dependent on a juvenile court, the court is in the position to issue those special findings that the youth would need to then go seek immigration status. Because even if a person, a young person is put into um, the care of the foster system, um, they, if they are removable as charged, they'll still have to appear before the immigration court in their removal proceedings and either raise a defense um, or face removal. Did, what, mm -hmm. did that get at the question, Senator? Yes. Mine, yeah. But also, um, I think it was a good suggestion, Senator Nitka, that we hear from DCF, that maybe not the commissioner, but somebody who's deal in, in the office who might deal with these cases. Maybe an attorney for DCF to... Yep. Right now we have DCF coming on Wednesday. Oh, good. So we would add to that. Okay. Hey, um, I think we have to run to a special session of the legislature to elect. Well, we don't have to run. It's only five past 10, but I guess we'll give ourselves some extra time.